the end of the second decade of the 20th century, China had gone through 10 years of post-imperial uh, turmoil. The First World War had come and gone. The hopes of perhaps a, uh, an improved situation in the world after the war had been dashed by the Versailles Peace Conference. Um, many Chinese had uh, begun to search for uh, radical alternatives to the ideas that had uh, brought China to its, its present circumstances, whether those were the traditional Confucian political culture or the more uh, liberal democratic ideas associated with the hopes of the Republican uh, movement. At the beginning of the 1920s, a new ideology, uh, which had uh, grown out of the uh, activities of anarchists and socialists uh, earlier in the century, and particularly from the influence of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, uh, took root in China and uh, took on institutional form in the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. The party was founded in Shanghai in 1921. It was the result, the, the, the get-together in July that, uh, that actually put the party uh, institutionally in place, formally in place, was the result of a process that had been going on for a couple of years. Uh, Marxist study groups uh, in, in Beijing and Shanghai and other places had sprung up uh, in the wake of the First World War and the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, these had uh, grown in size. They had begun to reach out and try to form links to uh, workers' organizations, to socialist groups in other parts of uh, the country. Um, beginning around 1920, as the Soviet Union began to pull itself together and the Communist International, the Third International, uh, was established, uh, agents sent out from Moscow began to uh, visit various parts of uh, Asia, and China in particular, to assist in the process of revolutionary organization. In China, uh, uh, agents from uh, the Communist International um, were involved both with the establishment of the Chinese Communist Party and with the reorganization of Sun Yat-sen's Nationalist Party. We'll talk about uh, uh, the Nationalists in a minute, but uh, first I want to finish up with, with getting the, uh, the Communists uh, organized. Um, these advisors uh, from the International who came to China worked with the Marxist study groups, uh, began to uh, do the groundwork to uh, establish a national organization, and uh, they helped to uh, suggest the, uh, the terms of a program, the organizational uh, format for uh, the, uh, uh, the new party. And in 1921, in the summer of 1921, um, assisted with the convening of the First Party Congress. There were only about a dozen delegates at the First Party Congress. Uh, many people were unable to travel to Shanghai to attend. Uh, some of the people who were uh, among this first dozen uh, uh, sort of drifted off into relative obscurity afterwards. One individual who was present, uh, although not because he had been uh, all that important an actor up to this point, uh, but certainly would become so later, uh, was Mao Zedong. Uh, Mao Zedong from Hunan province in central China, uh, had been um, uh, living in Beijing, had been exposed to the Marxist study groups there uh, through his work at the library in Beijing, um, and had made his way uh, to Shanghai and was able to take part uh, in this initial gathering. The communist advisors to both the, uh, the new party and to the nationalists um, put forward a, an analysis of the situation in China which called for uh, an alliance, a, a united front between the communists and the nationalists. Um, the Nationalist Party, which was still under the leadership of Sun Yat-sen in the early 1920s, was reorganized internally along the uh, disciplined lines of the Bolshevik Party, of the, the Russian Communist Party. And this made the Nationalist Party a much more effective organization than it had previously been. One of the problems, one of the frustrations that Sun Yat-sen had faced in his life was that um, he was a good orator, he was a good uh, speaker, a good fundraiser, a good propagandist, but he wasn't much of an organizer, and he didn't seem to have figured out a way to make the Nationalist Party into a truly effective political force. 
the advice of, uh, of the communists and the organizational changes that they helped to put in place within the Nationalist Party gave it greater cohesion, greater internal discipline, and turned it into a more uh, functional political organization. Uh, this did not mean that the Nationalist Party, or Sun Yat-sen, embraced the uh, Marxist-Leninist ideology of uh, the Bolsheviks or, or of the, uh, the advisors from the International, but it did mean that uh, Sun Yat-sen in particular was more uh, open to some kind of cooperation, some sort of uh, collaboration between uh, the new Communist Party and his Nationalist Party. Um, the first united front was accordingly uh, put together, and under the terms of this, um, individual members of the Chinese Communist Party could join the Nationalist Party, could be members, in other words, of both parties, and could indeed even uh, serve as officers within units of the Nationalist Party. Uh, the Communist Party was not to join the Nationalist Party organizationally. In other words, there wasn't a merger between the two parties, but individuals could be members of both parties. Uh, many individual communists did join the Nationalist Party, uh, participated within uh, political activities of the Nationalist Party, and some even uh, rose to positions of relative prominence within the Nationalist Party, including, uh, uh, with great uh, uh, significance for later developments, Mao Zedong, who uh, became um, uh, leader of the Peasant Bureau within the Nationalist Party. Uh, this was, um, uh, the peasantry was of course not seen as the, uh, the most important group. Uh, you know, uh, urban workers, industrial proletariat were, were seen as uh, uh, the focal point by both the Nationalists and the Communists. Uh, so Mao's uh, uh, position in dealing with the peasantry was, was not a particularly prestigious one, uh, but it becomes uh, his experience there and the ideas that he developed there uh, become quite uh, important, as we shall see uh, later on. In 1925, uh, Sun Yat-sen dies, and this is a, uh, a critical uh, turning point because uh, so long as Sun Yat-sen was alive, uh, so long as he was dedicated to, a, uh, uh, to his particular vision, of the Nationalist Revolution and of a, uh, a socially progressive version of, uh, of nationalism, the alliance with the Communist Party uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, the Communist Party was still relatively small. It certainly wasn't uh, an organizational threat to the Nationalists early on, uh, and, and Sun's uh, willingness to work together uh, resulted in benefits for both sides. It allowed the Communist Party to grow and to gain uh, a lot of experience, but it also uh, benefited the Nationalist Party. Much of the work that communist organizers did uh, was quite diligent and quite effective, and they, uh, they actually brought a lot of members into the Nationalist Party, uh, non-communist members into the Nationalist Party. In the wake of Sun Yat-sen's death, uh, something of a leadership vacuum develops uh, at the top of the Nationalist Party, and it takes a little while, uh, a year or so, uh, for a successor figure, a single successor figure, to really emerge. When that happens, uh, the individual who comes to dominate uh, the Nationalist Party, first uh, as a military leader and eventually as its political leader as well, is Chiang Kai-shek. Now, Chiang Kai-shek himself is a very interesting figure. He was a, uh, a military man, and he had been uh, sent by Sun Yat-sen to study uh, in Russia uh, and to learn about the Bolshevik Revolution, to learn about the, the communist uh, systems of organization, to learn about uh, the, the Red Army. And he had spent uh, uh, six months uh, studying and working uh, in Russia. When he came back from that experience, he was very impressed with the organizational skills and techniques of the Bolsheviks, but he was a confirmed anti-communist. He was very, very opposed to the political program of the Russian Revolution and the Communist Party. Uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek became the commandant of the uh, Nationalist Military Academy at Wampua, uh, outside of Canton, Guangzhou, in, in Guangdong province. And in that position, uh, was able to establish um, uh, 
uh, quite a network of personal connections and loyalties within the nationalist military. He used his influence within the army and his position as, uh, as leader of the nationalist army to uh, as a factor in the, in the political maneuvering that took place after Sun Yat-sen's death uh, and use that as a way to advance his own position uh, and eventually to emerge uh, as the new strongman within the Nationalist Party. Um, in 1926, the year after Sun Yat-sen's death, uh, Chiang Kai-shek finally felt himself to be uh, in a strong enough position within the nationalist movement and felt the nationalist movement itself to be strong enough militarily to uh, launch an effort to reunify China. And what he undertakes uh, we call the Northern Expedition. Uh, the nationalists uh, had, uh, had their base uh, down south uh, in, in Guangdong province. Uh, Guangdong province had essentially been the, the only part of China that the nationalist party uh, could control. Uh, the rest of China had, uh, of course, been divided up amongst uh, the various warlords. And, of course, it's in some ways possible to see Chiang Kai-shek as simply one of these warlords who happened to have the Nationalist Party as his political machine. Um, be that as it may, the, the Northern Expedition, when it gets underway in 1926, um, proves to be a very successful undertaking. The nationalist armies essentially follow the same route that the Taiping movement had followed uh, back in the 1850s, moving from Guangdong province up through central China, through Hunan, to the Yangtze River Valley, and then turning east and heading towards uh, Nanjing. And uh, moving a little more quickly than uh, the Taipings had uh, uh, over the course simply of a few months, they managed to gain control of most of southern China. And this happens through a variety of mechanisms. In some instances, the nationalist forces fight against the forces of local warlords, and they generally uh, win. Uh, they defeat the local uh, leaders and absorb them then into the nationalist forces. In other instances, Chiang Kai-shek was able to negotiate uh, political arrangements uh, 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 under which uh, local warlords would, uh, would pledge their loyalty to him and would therefore uh, sort of be brought under the nationalist umbrella. In other instances, he simply bribed people. He would uh, 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 you know, buy the loyalty of, uh, of individuals who couldn't be appealed to on any other basis and whom he didn't feel like uh, fighting or didn't wish to risk fighting. By one means or another, uh, the, the Northern Expedition succeeds uh, by the spring of 1927 in basically uh, uh, getting all of southern China, south of the Yangtze River, uh, 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 into nationalist hands. In April of 1927, um, the nationalist forces have reached the outskirts of Shanghai. And at this point, um, Chiang Kai-shek makes a decision that uh, uh, is of great political significance. He has reluctantly, up to this point, uh, maintained the united front with the Communist Party, which Sun Yat-sen had put in place. Uh, not wishing to uh, uh, jeopardize his own position as the heir of Sun Yat-sen, as the, the successor to Sun Yat-sen, he hasn't felt up till now strong enough uh, to do anything other than continue this policy. But by April of 1927, having successfully carried out the Northern Expedition, having gained all this control over uh, uh, half of China, he feels his position to be much stronger. And so he decides to do away with the communists, to eliminate them uh, not just as, uh, as uh, partners in the United Front, but to try to drive them out, to try to destroy them as a political force uh, in China. And accordingly, when the nationalist forces reach the outskirts of Shanghai, he stops. He does not take the nationalist army into the city, um, but instead uh, allows communist uh, uh, organizers within the city and, and within the trade unions in the city. Shanghai was uh, by this time the most industrialized city in China. Uh, many factories there, many thousands and thousands of workers, uh, most of whom were organized into trade unions uh, with at least links to, if not being dominated by, the Communist Party. 
When the Nationalist Army is approaching Shanghai, uh, the Communists launch an uprising. The idea is being to seize the city from within so that the Nationalist Army won't have to fight its way in. Uh, but Chiang Kai-shek stops outside of Shanghai and doesn't intervene, doesn't come in. And the insurrection in Shanghai is then suppressed by a combination of the troops of the foreign powers. Shanghai is sort of an international city, so the British, the French, the Americans, uh, the Germans at this time, uh, uh, the Japanese, rather, um, all have forces there. And those forces, those uh, police and military units are mobilized to attack the workers, to attack the communists. And in conjunction with those uh, uh, government forces of the foreign powers, um, the, the secret societies, the sort of organized crime circles within Shanghai also come out and start to attack uh, the workers and the communist organizers. And this combination of the foreign uh, powers and the sort of Shanghai underworld uh, destroy the communist movement in Shanghai. Uh, uh, many, many hundreds of communist organizers and leaders are arrested and executed. Uh, others die in fighting in the streets. Many workers are shot uh, uh, or arrested and imprisoned and some of them executed, uh, even if they weren't members of the Communist Party. It's a very bloody um, uprising and suppression of the communist movement uh, in Shanghai. And it represents, it signals the break, the split between the Nationalist Party uh, and the Communist Party. It takes a while for this political process to completely unfold. A, uh, a sort of left-wing group within the Nationalist Party, which is centered at the city of Wuhan on the central Yangtze River, um, continues to ally itself with the Communist Party for a while. Uh, but before long, Chiang Kai-shek is able to convince them that uh, they really need to split with the communists and stick with him. He intimidates them militarily. Uh, and uh, by the end of the summer of, uh, of 1927, uh, the left wing of the, of the Nationalist Party reunites with, with Chiang Kai-shek's mainstream. And Chiang now is the undisputed leader of the nationalist movement and of a nationalist movement which is no longer, in his view, hampered by this alliance with the Chinese Communist Party. Well, the Chinese Communist Party finds itself in a difficult situation. Um, their principal political orientation up to this time had been towards organizing urban workers. Uh, the classical theories of Marxism had emphasized the role of the industrial working class as the vanguard of the revolution. This was the force which would, which would lead the transformation of society, build socialism. Um, but now, the organizational base of the Chinese Communist Party in the cities, amongst the industrial workers, uh, is destroyed. Uh, Shanghai was the most important location, but uh, once this uh, rupture takes place in Shanghai, it's repeated elsewhere in, in other ports, in other centers of industry, and the communists are systematically driven out of urban China. How is the party to survive? What are they to do? It's at this point that uh, the role of Mao Zedong begins to be significant. Um, Mao Zedong as leader of the Peasant Bureau of the Nationalist Party, had spent a lot of time in the countryside, had spent a lot of time observing what was happening away from the cities, away from the great coastal ports, in places like his home province of Hunan. And what he saw was large peasant movements, uh, not unlike peasant movements that we have seen at earlier times in, in Chinese history, but now movements which were taking place in the modern world, in a modern context, and which could be imbued with a modern ideology and led by, in Mao's view, a modern political party. He saw the uprisings of the peasants as a very, very powerful force, a force so powerful that, as he put it to his comrades, their choice was to either try to lead it or just to get out of the way, because this movement was going to sweep across the country. And if the Communist Party could lead it, they could turn it into a revolutionary force. 
Well, these ideas had been pretty marginal up until this time. But in the wake of the suppression of the party in the cities, Mao's ideas suddenly begin to seem a little more reasonable. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. In fact, it takes a number of years for Mao's ideas to begin to be accepted and to begin to be dominant within the Chinese Communist Party. Initially, when the party is devastated in the cities, um, the remnants of the party leadership and the advisors from the Soviet Union uh, simply call for, for greater revolution. Uh, and they urge communists in various parts of the country to launch insurrections and to try to, to sort of jumpstart the revolution. And this leads to a series of really disastrous uprisings. Um, Mao himself is drawn into one of these when he is ordered to lead a, uh, a peasant uh, army to capture a, a city in central China. Uh, they do so for a few days, but then they're driven out by the, uh, the better armed and better organized uh, forces of the Nationalist Army. And it's after this that Mao retreats with the remnants of his peasant army to the mountains of southern Jiangxi province. And it is there, along with other uh, uh, local communist leaders and, and uh, the remnants of a few others of these, uh, of these abortive uh, uprisings, that he begins to put together uh, a new model for uh, the Chinese Communist uh, movement. This rural base area, as it comes to be called, um, in, in essence becomes a sort of laboratory. And in the early 1930s, uh, Mao and uh, a man named Zhu De, who was a, a communist military leader, and Zhou Enlai, who becomes one of Mao's greatest uh, political allies, um, these individuals work together uh, with um, several million uh, peasants in, in southern Jiangxi to create a communist um, experiment to, uh, to carry out experiments in land reform, in reforming the, the Chinese family system, uh, a variety of, of things which later on, after the Communist Party comes to power nationally, will be implemented uh, in a fully developed way, but in, in the early 30s in Jiangxi, they're just experimenting. They're, they're sort of trying things out in a, in a sort of laboratory of peasant society. Well, Chiang Kai-shek went on after 1927 to complete the unification uh, of China. In 1928, he takes his forces on to the north, uh, uh, defeats or wins over the remaining warlords, uh, and establishes uh, a reunified uh, China, a single nationalist government now based at Nanjing again, uh, with Chiang Kai-shek as the leader, uh, comes, to be, uh, comes to be put in place. Even while he's completing uh, the second half of the northern expedition, Chiang begins to have conflicts with the Japanese. Japanese military units are in Shandong province to protect uh, their concession at, at Qingdao and some of their railway lines. Um, there are confrontations between Japanese military units and Chang's forces uh, in 1928 in Shandong. Um, later on, uh, the Japanese blow up the train of one of uh, Chang's warlord allies in northern China uh, um, because they want to uh, eliminate him as a threat to their position uh, in, uh, in Korea. So tensions between Chiang Kai-shek and the Japanese, between China and the Japanese, begin to show a little more clearly at the end of the 1920s and beginning of the 1930s. But Chiang Kai-shek determines that the real problem that he needs to deal with, the real enemy that he faces, uh, is not the Japanese, uh, but the Chinese. He says very famously that the Japanese are a disease of the skin, where the communists are a disease of the guts. And so he's willing to ignore um, the activities of the Japanese to a great extent and concentrates his efforts on fighting against the communists. The base area uh, in southern Jiangxi, which is only one of a number of these areas where, where local communist forces establish uh, control, but it's probably the most significant one, uh, becomes the focal point of Chang's activities in the early 1930s. And he launches a series of um, uh, what are called encirclement campaigns, where he basically uh, puts 
uh, a blockade, military forces completely surrounding the communist base area, and then slowly but surely uh, closing the ring, moving closer and closer in. The first several of these efforts uh, are defeated. The communists manage to, uh, to fight back and drive off the nationalist forces, but, uh, but Chiang keeps the pressure up. Uh, he begins in the 30s to get military advice uh, from the Germans, uh, the Nazi party that uh, has come to power in, in Germany in the early 30s um, begins to form uh, a, a fairly close working relationship with Chang that will be suspended later when they become more, even more closely allied with the Japanese. Uh, but for a while in the mid-30s, German advisors are, are very helpful in, uh, uh, in leading the anti-communist campaigns for Chiang Kai-shek. And eventually, uh, by 1934, uh, it, it becomes apparent that the latest encirclement campaign of the nationalists against the, the Jiangxi base area, which is sometimes called the Jiangxi Soviet, is going to be successful. And the communist leaders then have to decide um, what they're going to do, how they're going to cope with this threat. Um, what they decide uh, leads to one of the most dramatic events uh, in, in 20th century Chinese history, an event which, uh, which continues to um, inspire uh, uh, young Chinese even today. And this is what's called the Long March. In October of 1934, uh, the communists decide that um, they're not going to be able to resist Chiang Kai-shek and the encirclement campaign much longer. There is another... Um, base area uh, far away in northwestern China, uh, centered on a, a small uh, town called Yan'an, and they decide that they're going to try to break out from the Jiangxi area and make their way uh, to Yan'an. This is a long, long way to go, um, and they don't know exactly how to get there uh, or how they will survive uh, in the process of doing so. Nonetheless, they, they figure this is their best option, their only real chance. And so, uh, uh, in mid-October of 1934, 115,000 people uh, break out from the encirclement. A small contingent is left behind uh, in the heartland of, uh, of the Jiangxi uh, uh, base area to uh, uh, make a last stand against the nationalist forces and also to keep those nationalist forces occupied so that they won't... Uh, be able to pursue uh, the Long Marchers as they set out. The Long March um, strikes off to the south and west, and in the course of the next year, uh, they troop over several thousand kilometers. Uh, it's not a, a simple uh, uh, straight path off to the northwest that they take. Uh, they travel through several provinces. They have to cross mountain ranges, swamps, uh, deep river gorges. It's a, a very dramatic event. They're constantly being pursued and harassed by nationalist forces. Of the um, 115,000 people who embark on the Long March, 15,000 complete it. So 100,000 people are lost one way or another uh, along the way. Early in the course of the Long March, a very important political event takes place, which is that Mao Zedong uh, is named leader of the communist movement. He assumes the position of chairman of the party, and he uh, holds this position uh, uninterruptedly uh, until his death in 1976. The triumph of Mao um, sets the stage for uh, the the latter part of the Chinese Revolution. Once the Long March reaches Yan'an uh, at the end of 1936, I'm sorry, at the end of 1935, um, the, the, the great age of, of what comes to be called the, the Yan'an era or the Yan'an base area uh, gets started. And in the Northwest, the communists uh, have a new laboratory, a new arena in which to experiment with their policies and their organizational methods. Uh, later on, when the Japanese invasion comes, the Yan'an base area will be uh, the center of resistance against the Japanese invasion. Um, and indeed, 
uh, by the end of 1936, from their position in the Northwest, they're able to enter into a second united front with the Nationalists. We'll see the circumstances of that and how the war with Japan and the revolution which follows it play out in our next lecture.